Welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight uh, for our JCRC's wrap up of the 2022 legislative session. I'm Bob Budoff, and I have the honor of serving as a co-chair of JCRC's Northern Virginia Commission. Uh, we're lucky to have with us three good friends of our community, legislators from our region, who will share a summary and analysis of what transpired in Richmond this winter. First, we have Delegate Eileen Philicorn, uh, representing parts of Fairfax, Fairfax Station, in West Springfield, the former majority leader. She was the first Jewish woman, in fact, the first Jew and the first woman to serve in that role. And we in our community are very proud of her. She spent her time in the legislature as a listener, a problem solver, delivering results that move her community forward and advocating for everyone equally, regardless of their background, their circumstance, or their ideology. She's introduced, championed, and passed legislation that has made Virginia a safer, a stronger, and a more equitable community. And prior to her election to the House, she has also served in the administrations of Governors Mark Warner and Tim Kaine. Next, we will have Senator Scott Zuraville, whose district includes parts of Fairfax, Prince William, and Stafford counties. He served in the General Assembly since 2009. He moved from the House of Delegates to the Senate in 2015. He currently serves on transportation, commerce and labor, judiciary, privileges and elections, and rehabilitation and social service committees. And he is the Senate Majority Caucus Vice Chair. Finally, we will have, we'll hear from Delegate Mark Sickles, Delegate Sickles has represented the 43rd district, including parts of Fairfax County since 2004. He currently serves on health, welfare and institutions, privileges and elections, appropriations and rules committees. It's from his experience on appropriations that he will share with us highlights of the newly approved commission, Commonwealth budget, including the Jewish community's priorities. And now I'd like to turn it over and introduce and welcome Delegate Eileen Philicorn. Thank you so much, Bob and uh, Vicki and Ron and Beth for having me on tonight. And it's great to see you all and great to see uh, Senator Servell and uh, uh, Delegate Sickles and so many other friends. And uh, it's, you know, I know we're, we're, still on, we're still on Zoom, but it's nice to have the, the opportunity to see you all and see your faces. And thank you so much to JCRC for all of your support. Uh, when I think of all the issues that are so important to us, and as I started going through your, the letter that you all sent to us, uh, the entire delegation about your priorities and your advocacy, it's, it's just, just reminded me how important your advocacy is and you have always been consistent advocates for all of our shared values. And uh, so we're just really appreciative of your partnership and appreciative of all that you were able to do to help us continue the, the fight to protect all of our progress and uh, make sure we're able to continue to keep Virginians best interests first. Uh, so appreciate the introduction. And you know, when I think back, Bob and everybody from, you know, from the, the time that uh, first became speaker, I'm so incredibly proud of all the transformational changes that we were able to provide and deliver for the Commonwealth. And so much of that progress were issues that you all have been out there steadfast and supportive for so long. Um, talking about you know, healthcare and reproductive rights and economic growth and gun violence prevention, voting rights, um, environmental justice and so many other is you know, issues. Also standing there um, you know, with regard to the support uh, for Israel and our friends in Israel and so many other issues. Um, you know, this, this year things were different obviously. And um, you know, it was a, uh, obviously us being back in the minority, we, we saw a lot of attempts uh, by the other side of the aisle to roll back a lot of the progress that we've made and a lot of the accomplishments that we, you know, that we have made. And so we knew that this session would be a little bit different in the house and that we were going to really make sure that obviously as we stood up for the issues and values that were important to us, um, and again, you know, with, with you all by our side, we need to shine a light on what was going to happen. And we did exactly that. And that included a lot of um, incredible speeches on the floor, um, you know, also using uh, the press, the media, social media, 
Um, and then with the, uh, you know, with the help of the brick wall in the Senate that you'll hear from soon, um, you know, I'm proud to say that we were able to, you know, protect all of our progress. And that was not easy. And again, it bears repeating, we could not have done it without all of your support and fully recognizing that, you know, you all have been there, you know, from the beginning. So I think of so many, so many issues that, that were important to us and that we had to, you know, fight for. And I think of um, at the top of the list and looking at your list of priorities is definitely voting rights. Um, and when I think back to the times when we were um, governing, I was speaker, we were able to take the Commonwealth from being one of the worst states for ballot accessibility to one of the best. And, you know, we worked diligently to expand voting right protections in Virginia. That included the, you know, um, including repealing voter ID laws and providing more for absentee voting, early voting, same day voting. And this year, um, there were several, several bills and several attempts to roll that back. Um, one of them was um, specifically HJ28, uh, which you all was on your list um, as I review your list of bills that you supported. It was a constitutional uh, amendment guaranteeing automatic rights restoration um, to returned citizens. And they voted not just once, but twice to kill it. And they killed it. They, they worked to do that in subcommittee hearings at 7 a.m. And then again, they also worked to try to reject it three more times on the floor. But thanks to you all and our other uh, uh, partners and thanks to the, uh, the hard work of the Senate, uh, they were able to really reject those, um, the bills and, uh, you know, and make sure that our progress was not rolled back over the last two years. And that also included um, HJ34, which was one of the bills that you all you know, opposed. In addition to voting rights, I think of um, the environment, and we saw attempts by Governor Yunkin and House Republicans to threaten our participation in REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, also attempts to strike down the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which you all supported and we worked so hard. Um, but the, um, you know, our caucus did not back down and we stood 48 strong and our partners again in the Senate, you'll hear, defeated the attempts to weaken all of the environmental protections that we worked so hard for. Gun violence prevention, um, another important issue. Again, this year um, in the House, they tried, um, the, the House Republican majority tried their hardest to repeal gun violence prevention measures that we, that we have passed and that we know the progress that we have made literally keeps Virginians safer. So um, they made those attempts with the red flag laws, um, the, uh, the bill that we passed also allowing localities to choose where guns are permitted, whether or not they're permitted in their communities, limiting uh, firearms in preschools and places of worship, um, mandatory reporting lost and stolen firearms. Um, so the list goes on and on. And I know again, on, on your list of priorities, you were there advocating for us. Um, in contrast, I'd say that our caucus continued our commitment to making sure that we could keep all Virginians safe. Um, by making it illegal to possess, give, or sell in a firearm that had a serial number removed or altered in any way. Um, we all saw, see what's going on um, you know, federally right now and abortion access, um, right to choose has been you know, a, a top priority for us. And just this session, we actually saw bills to reinstate um, informed consent, biased counseling practices. That was Governor Greenhall's bill, um, HB 212, ultrasound requirements, and even a Texas style abortion ban after 20 weeks. Um, you know, so let me just be clear that those attacks on our reproductive um, freedoms have no place here in Virginia and um, abortion access and uh, right to choose it continues to be legal in Virginia. But uh, just, you know, it's a stark reminder of just how close Virginia could be to becoming the next state that would or could criminalize abortions. We'll hear more about that from the Senate, um, you know, I'm sure as well. And uh, so it's important for us to continue to, you know, to be very vocal. Um, you all supported one of, another one of uh, my bill 719, which was passed uh, unanimously. Vicki and I were talking about that earlier. Um, and I so appreciate your support and that would uh, that removed the exemptions on um, in the current law that caused some uh, perk kits, the physical evidence recovery kits to be immediately destroyed. And um, so we set the standard there in that bill for the storage of all perks to uh, 10 years. So I was pleased to get that through. You know, I'm proud to say that um, the House Democratic Caucus passed you know, over 200 bills to, again, focusing on all the issues that are important to us, healthcare, access to um, quality healthcare, nutrition, strengthening workers' rights, strengthening our workforce, protecting vulnerable populations, support for climate resilience, criminal justice reform, disability advocacy, and so much more. And um, I actually, I think you all were 
um, active on in support of my bill also um, HB 717, which focused on um, homeless um, uh, youth homelessness um, and the crisis that you know with unaccompanied youth. Um, so we got that bill through as you know as well. So I'm, I'm proud how we were able in the House to fight this session, grateful for our partners in the Senate, and you'll hear soon from them, to making sure that we could protect all of our progress and all the growth that we've made over the last few years. And I can assure you all that we're gonna continue to be loud and vocal in support of uh, those values and do all that, you know, that I can, that we can do to make sure that we reelect our um, you know, majorities in the United States House and Senate, but we also need to really focus on, you know, laying the groundwork and the foundations for a big uh, comeback in Richmond. Um, we need to make sure that we can bring the House back to the majority, and we need to make sure that we can grow our majority in the Senate because, uh, you know, we know how important these issues are, and we also have seen just, you know, just see, we've seen what happens and what can happen when when you don't elect like-minded people or when you do. Um, and uh, so I just wanna thank you all for the opportunity to be here, share a little bit about what transpired in the last session. Um, thank you all for uh, your partnership. And I think I'd probably turn it back to uh, Bob to introduce Senator Serval. I, I think we can go right to the Senator, so. Great. Hey, Bob, thanks. Uh, sure. Thank you. And uh, I join you all from Nationals Park. Maybe you can see the bridge over the Anacostia behind me there. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's good to be with you all. Unfortunately, it's three nothing already with one out in the top of the first. So the game's not going well here. <laughs> but it's, it's good to be with JCRC. And I'm sorry I missed your December meeting. I, I think I was out of the country when it happened. I, I always try to get there every year. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about all the fun we had in the state Senate this year. And, uh, and, um, and then uh, unfortunately, Delegate Sickles has already heard this speech about two or three times, but I'm gonna go really fast because there is a lot to talk about everything that we killed. We, we were really specialists in killing a lot of bills. Um, and um, first of all, we killed, I wanna say about 25 bills on voting. Just to give you an idea of, of how how close we are to Armageddon. We are one vote away, one vote away from really bad things happening in Virginia. And all of these bills I'm gonna list off here died pretty much by one vote. So we had four bills to reinstate voter ID, a bill to get rid of drop boxes, a bill to get rid of our no excuse absentee voting law that we passed that uh, you heard Eileen talk about a moment ago. A bill to get rid of our permanent absentee voting list, a bill to reduce early voting from 45 days back to 14 days. We have bills to get rid of early red early same day registration. We got bills to get rid of, um, to put conditions back on absentee ballots. We had a lot of fun on guns. We made a lot of progress on guns uh, a couple, couple years ago, but this session we had bills to abolish Virginia's one gun a month law, to put guns back in churches, to put guns back in daycares, to put guns back in schools. We had bills to repeal my legislation to allow localities to regulate firearms. You heard Eileen talk about that a moment ago. You had bills to repeal our red flag law, bills to allow people to carry guns into the state capitol once again, so they could take, for example, an AR-15 to come visit us and lobby us again. We had bills to um, uh, get rid of restrictions on concealed weapon permits, to allow people to have guns with protective orders. Um, we had a whole we had a whole bunch of bills to repeal everything we did on criminal justice reform. We you know, we made some, I, I want to say like, 100 year 200 year changes in Virginia law when it comes to criminal justice reform. For example, I carried the bill to get rid of the death penalty. There was a bill to reintroduce the death penalty. We killed that. We killed legislation to um, repeal our criminal or, or racial uh, profiling legislation that we passed that, that restricts when police officers can stop people. We we killed bills to allow police officers to charge school children with disorderly conduct again, to get rid of our no-knock warrant ban. We passed the law about Breonna Taylor to prohibit no-knock warrants. They wanted to repeal that. They tried to repeal our legislation authorizing civilian review boards, uh, to repeal what we did on, on marijuana possession, to reinstitute jury, sen jury sentencing, to uh, restrict the ability to introduce mental health evidence in a, in a criminal case. And a bill, there was also a bill introduced to repeal the record sealing bill that I passed that allows people to steal convictions that they've been of good behavior for seven or eight years. 
Um, you already heard Eileen talk about a few of the environmental bills, but they tried to basically dial back all the environmental progress we did, whether it was on Reggie or requiring or our new incentives to allow or to enhance the sales of electric vehicles, the Virginia Clean Energy Act. Um, the uh, you heard Eileen talk a moment ago. I think about choice. They they introduced a bill to basically reinstitute every single restriction on a woman's right to choose that we got rid of, and that would include 24-hour waiting period, bias counseling, trap regulations, um, the um, uh, reinstating the ultrasound requirement that we passed a couple years ago over everybody on this call's objection. Uh, they introduced legislation to repeal Delegate Sickles bill that allows people to hold people accountable for discrimination on the basis of um, race, religion, sexual orientation, se uh, sexual identity. They wanted to allow school boards to uh, discriminate against transgendered students again. We killed legislation that would have removed localities authority to allow collective bargaining for our government employees and our local government, which you've been seeing used all over Northern Virginia right now. Um, and I could talk some more. But I'm not gonna because <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of stuff we killed. But I just want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for standing with us, not just the last year or the last three years, but every year I've served, and I'm sure every year um, Delegate Sickles has served. You all are a voice of reason um, within the religious community. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I don't believe that the, um, the Republicans have monopoly when it comes to the faith community's views on on public policy and. You all are a strong voice for sanity when it comes to a lot of these issues. And um, I appreciate everything you do. Look forward to working with you in the future. And I'll, I'll stick around for a couple of questions. And then I need to stop being rude and hang out with my daughter at this baseball game I'm at. But thank you for having me tonight. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Senator Saraville. And you deserve a lot of thanks from us. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn it over to Delegate Sickles. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me uh, on this forum. I always enjoy uh, listening to uh, Scott give that recitation. It's scary. I mean, it's true. That stuff all passed the House that he mentioned. That all passed the House on 52, 48 votes, partisan votes, and went over there and got killed. Uh, just a couple of things uh, got escaped over there. But uh, that's how thin a read we're, we're uh, facing going forward and why this uh, election next year on the, well, it could be this year for the House as this court, um, this court, this litigation is ongoing on whether we need to run this year. The time is, uh, clock is running out on that though. So it's likely that it's gonna be next year with the Senate. Anyway, um, uh, the budget news is real good. As if you read uh, in the paper, uh, our revenues um, paradoxically just soared during the, um, during the pandemic, the worst parts of the pandemic, you can have your the reasons for that. You probably all know people wanted bigger homes further out, uh, more room to work at home. And when you buy a new house, all the things that go with that move the economy. Um, people are, uh, sales taxes were way up because all the deliveries from Amazon, et cetera, to your door uh, came in, in spades. and. We had just uh, benefited from a Supreme Court decision called the Wayfair decision, where we weren't collecting all that sales tax prior to that very important Supreme Court decision that allowed us to do it, all the states, and uh, that came in handy. And so uh, we have a lot of money, and we add to that what uh, Congress sent us in support for, for renters and for businesses, small businesses, for restaurants, for the um, industries in the tourism, hospitality industries. So um, the support from the federal government was very helpful as well to, to have this good result. So right now, the, the final budget is being uh, debated uh, in the conference committee. Uh, I'm on it. I'm not involved in every decision, to put it mildly. But uh, I do know that it's, gonna, it's going well. The governor um, probably helped slow it down by tr pushing us to come to Richmond on April 4th. Um, he did that without talking to Senate leadership, which is in Democratic control, as we've discussed here. And uh, they weren't ready by then. And it's probably not going to be ready for a couple more weeks. But uh, not to worry, we're going to get it done with maybe a month to spare or more before the fiscal year starts on July 1. So 
what are the things that uh, we're going to spend more money on than ever? And a lot of this is really good from, from my perspective and from our caucus's perspective. Early childhood education is going to have record funding. K through 12 is going to have record funding. We'll probably have a 5% raise for our uh, instructional personnel. We're going to have record funding in higher ed, in conservation, natural resources, a lot for wastewater and other water infrastructure, um, and, and funding, fully funding agricultural BNPs. That's a, 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 um, a primary way that we protect the Chesapeake Bay from, from allowing uh, non point sources of pollution to enter the bay, phosphorus and nitrogen and other fertilizers, things like that. Um, the the um, governor has been in the, been the paper, <clears throat> you might have heard a couple of days ago, he, he said he liked the Senate version better of the early childhood, which was the Senate generally had more money than we did on, on almost everything because the House passed um, uh, the governor's tax cuts, which were very expensive. The, uh, doubling the standard deduction is a $2 billion expenditure. Um, the, the budget conference is not going to go that far. It's not going to double it. It's only effective until uh, 2026 anyway. Um, there will be an increase in the standard deduction. And, and uh, uh, for people who don't itemize, that's going to happen. It's just the extent of uh, that uh, increase. Also, um, the Ralph Northam budget, which is what the base document we're working from, had uh, a reduction in the food tax for two of the three places where it goes now. Um, since 1986 or 1987, there's been a 0.05% tax sales tax that goes into the Transportation Trust Fund. Uh, the part that, uh, is, that comes from groceries is uh, significant. It's, uh, and it's going to take a cut out of our transportation resources. And this is in the, this is in Ralph Northam's introduced budget. Um, and nobody is going to try to replace that money at this point because of the, the federal infrastructure bill that <clears throat> finally passed and, um, and our other revenues coming in. So we're gonna eat that. Um, that's not a good position in Northern Virginia to have. I think we have plenty of uses for those transportation fundings. I hope all of you on this call have, have uh, been able to see with your own eyes what has happened since 2013 when we had a breakthrough transportation bill that has uh, spurred a lot of the construction that we see going on all over our region. Um, the other cent um, that is in Governor Northam's budget for the food tax reduction is money that goes straight to school divisions based on school age population in the county. So even if the kids are in private school like Governor Youngkins are, his kids would count toward um, the money that we would get back on the school age population. So we are, we are backfilling that money for the localities, but uh, those, those two items will be in any final uh, bill. The, uh, the difference between the House and the Senate is the, is the House took the 1% option as well and backfilled that with cash. And that 1% local option has been around for many, many years. I, it, long before my time, localities were um, able to add one cent to, to help uh, take the pressure off the real estate tax. So, you know, as you know, local government has very few options on how to raise money. They're over-reliant, in my opinion, on the property tax. And this is one thing they have that makes them a little less reliant on the property tax. And uh, that is an issue to be resolved, um, whether we uh, go ahead and take the governor's proposal or, and the house position, which would require backfilling those funds, very expensive, or not doing it and, uh, and lessening the worry that localities might have that we won't continue backfilling it in the future. Because today, you know, Fairfax County knows that we don't have anything to do with that, that one cent. Um, and it comes back directly to them and they can rely on it. If we took that away, just on a promise that we would pay it back in the future, it does not uh, make localities feel really good about it. So that issue is still out there to be resolved. Um, what else can I say? The, um, that's, really the, that's really the big picture. The, uh, the, the governor wants reduced taxes and most everything, he wants a lot of more spending too. He wants to spend more on mental health, which we need to do. We have a lot more money for mental health and for diversion away from our 
um, criminal justice system, a, a diversion away from institutions and into more community settings, which we have not done well over the years. We, we are considered a state that's over-reliant on institutions for, uh, for taking care of our behavioral health issues. And that's because we don't have the community services that we need, uh, that in the case of um, IDD, uh, intellectual disabilities, the um, Justice Department is making us uh, do better at. And so uh, I think there's going to be a good human services budget. Maybe it'll probably be the biggest ever. Um, one of our biggest problems in delivering services in the healthcare space is the uh, salaries. Um, you know, we are the payer. So, you know, the government doesn't, can't react as quickly as a business can to a changing business environment. So we actually have to raise the rates that we pay to keep people in business, keep providing these services. I know uh, we've, we've got money in the budget for Jewish homes and a couple of other charities that, that uh, you guys are big supporters of. And I think you'll be happy with the steps forward that you'll see in this budget whenever it gets finished soon, I hope. I think that covers it and I look forward to trying to answer any questions. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat so far. The first one I think goes to Senator Surville and that's what weren't you successful in blocking? Hey, hey first of all, I just want to note that during the time Delegate Sickles was talking and that scored two runs, one Soto just took him deep from one knee. So it's almost a tie game. So maybe we Mark needs to talk some more. But um, <laughs> no, Cap, I'm, I'm worrying about the caps tonight. Scott. Yeah, me, yeah, me yeah. too. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. What didn't we block? Um, we had a little, there was a bill about uh, that, that undid a little bit of our TJ legislation that I wasn't happy about, um, but it really didn't do a lot. The, the, the version that ended up passing. Um, what else didn't we pass? Um, Mark and Eileen, help me out. You guys probably noticed more than I did. We were What's the uh, COVID response? The COVID, COVID oh, yeah, the was the masking bill. One. Yeah, the masking bill, right. Yeah. So we passed a bill that basically limited local government or local school board's authority to, um, to prohibit or to require people to wear masks to school. Um, Senator Peterson felt very strongly about that. Um, his youngest daughter, uh, is a special needs child and had a really rough time getting education uh, in a virtual environment. And I felt like that really kind of deeply affected his, his view on that. And he felt very strongly that we needed to move on from masks in schools. And we ended up passing a, a bill that I thought was kind of over-inclusive. I mean, we were kind of in the process of getting rid of masks at the time we passed it, but the le legislation we passed basically said that the government can never require masks in schools ever again, which was just overkill. And it ended up passing on a very thin vote. I think it was 23-17 at the end. That was probably the biggest sort of chink in the wall, I think. Um, beyond that, um, we also went backwards on car exhaust. Uh, there was a, you know, the, the, the bill that we passed in, 20, in the 2020 special session that restricted the reasons law enforcement could stop vehicles included that you could not stop a car for loud exhaust. And the reason for that was that a lot of people feel like the only people that get stopped for loud exhaust are minorities or people that are being stopped for another reason where the cop wants to get in their car and sniff around. Um, you know, and I, I've talked with a lot of law enforcement that really don't know how to enforce the loud exhaust rule in a fair way that it's kind of in the eye of the beholder kind of thing. But after we passed it, uh, there was a lot of neighborhoods and citizens that were complaining about loud cars in their neighborhood and, and the police would say, Hey, we can't do anything. And then the supervisor would tell them to call us and the supervisor would tell us, Hey, our police want this authority back. And so um, a lot of members actually both in the house and the Senate democratic members ended up voting to restore the authority for police to enforce that law as a primary offense. Again, that was another one. Um, other than that, I can't think of any others right off the top of my head. Eileen and Mark might have, have a couple they might remember. No, I, I mean, you know, we, we consider ourselves very fortunate that the Senate was the brick wall there and, and did a superb job of making sure that all of our progress wasn't rolled back. So great job. 
Yeah, and by the way, the house the house really pre-gamed a lot of that stuff for us because a lot of those bills came through the house and the house of delegates really vetted that stuff and refined their arguments and sort of teed it up for us so that when it got to us it was a lot it was a lot easier for us to to uh take care of business shall we say so um they're kind of our canaries in the coal mine on that stuff so it was really a team effort on all that um i've got i have several other questions i think that i think that delegate um sickles did address the fact that there's additional funds for mental health services this one was specifically about mental health services for young people and there's more to come um yes when, no there is some yes. and there's a there's a, a newer program that we have that helps uh physicians with children that we've only had a couple years that was popular that we we increase i'm trying to remember the acronym for it now um but generally speaking, the, the provider community needed a raise just because of the uh, competition that we have from other, uh, you know, doing this work is hard. And sometimes you're dealing with violent people and you can come home with a black eye and you're making 12 or $13 an hour. And obviously there's other alternatives for people out there. So our, I think our primary step forward will be just paying people more, you know, the value for their services um, and providing, providing more services. And, and, and we're lucky in Northern Virginia because our, our community services boards are working together closely now on crisis response services. Uh, we've got a new facility open in Chantilly that can take people for 24 hours. The um, fa uh, facility in Maryfield is also, uh, if they haven't gotten their license, they were, their license was pending to be able to hold people for 24 hours and keep them away from the criminal justice system. And, and we've had a diversion first program going on there for a while, but this is much better. This is more comprehensive services, getting same day service and, and uh, that type of thing. So um, I think we're all uh, working together with the local government and the state government to do a better job. And I'm hoping to make real progress on this in the next few years. One more question for you, uh, uh, Delegate Sickles. Uh, how much? How much is in in the affordable housing trust fund? Well, um, the House passed fifty five million dollars, which would be a, a record amount from the state. Just a couple of years ago, we were at seven or eight million, and of course, this money is leveraged by uh, by developers to to result in a lot more housing than that. But we passed fifty five million. Senate, I don't know the Senate's number. But it was a lot bigger than that, and uh, the, eighty million, I think. Oh, okay. So um, the number is going to be somewhere between uh, fifty-five and eighty. I think it might be more than eighty, Scott. Um, actually, and, and of course, some of that is going to permanent supportive housing. Uh, Senator Hal is uh, big on that, and that is part of the solution to keep getting people out of institutions if they can live at home with some help. And have people making sure that they stay on their medication and stuff like that. Uh, we don't have enough permanent supportive housing, and some of the some of the money in housing is going to that purpose. But generally speaking, um, we at the state level are just getting into affordable housing in a big way in these last couple of years. That's why I said it's 180 million. So 180. Oh, okay. okay. And, and by the way, Mark Fox and more. It's now four three knots in the bottom of the first. So it's all going good. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I, I think I can open this up to all of you. What progress has been made to provide financial assistance grants to houses of worship for security upgrades, considering the increase in violent threats and anti-Semitism and racism in general? That's certainly been something I've been fighting for for a while, and we've had some progress thanks to you all. But Mark, I don't know if there's specifically in the uh, what's specifically in the well, budget and or whether it was discussed. Yeah, uh, the budget had one and a half million dollars, you know, through DCJS uh, to, for, to protect religious institutions. And that was not a, uh, a changed by either, either body. So it's one and a half million at this point. I don't know where that is historically. It's probably a lot uh, what, and, you know, over what we've done in the past, but I don't know for sure. 
and again, we're still waiting to see what the obviously the, the final budget looks like in the compromise. So we can certainly get back to you all with the details and specifics. Uh, I have another question and a question about people who are concerned about uh, our Afghan ally, allies that many of the synagogues are sponsoring and whether there's additional funds from the Virginia Office of New Americans for housing and for other services. Mark, that, that's probably a Mark Sickles question. <laughs> more than <that>. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, there is but I don't know the number. I don't have the, I can get it to you. I can find out <laughs> yeah. what it is, but we are using some of the federal money to do that. Um, and I just don't have the numbers on the tip of my tongue. But thank you all for your advocacy on that. And obviously that's something we're, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot about regularly. So we can get back to you with specifics, but thanks for all that, you know, that you all are doing and all the JCRC members through various synagogues. Someone asked whether you are aware of an outbreak in Fairfax, and I assume they're talking about COVID. It says some of which were weren't posted in the Virginia Department of Health website in a timely manner, if at all. I personally don't know the numbers. Um, I'm not sure if Mark or Scott do. We can certainly get back to you on that too. There's definitely been an increase in cases, but I don't have numbers. And then someone asked about the status of the Dillon rule. Nope, no changes it's there. It's alive and well. <laughs> it's doing fine. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> and I think that does it for the questions for now. Go Nats. Go Caps. Yeah, yeah it's now, <laughs> Nats are now ahead, 5-3. Oh my God. Wow. Thank you all again for, for your advocacy and support. You know, I mean, we, we've made tremendous progress and this year we prevented a lot of uh, that progress from being rolled back. And as I said in the beginning, we couldn't have done it without you all and your support over the years before we were in the majority, before we were able to actually pass these bills has been invaluable. So, but we need your continued support and partnership and advocacy moving forward. Thanks I'm just again. gonna, I just wanted to supplement real quick what um, Delegate Sickles said on the security grants. I think you weren't sure if it was an increase. If, if it is at the 1.5 million, that is the same that it was last year. Um, okay. So I think it is holding steady. Okay, I don't think anyone is trying to push that up in conference, but I can check to see if anybody is doing that. Uh, remember in the process uh, that we're under right now, when we finish it, the governor gets it back again and gets to make recommendations and that we'll have to come back and approve or, or deny. And um, he has a lot of ideas. He wants to cut your taxes and spend more money. So it'll be interesting to see how he, he does that. And you know, this isn't one of many areas that he could decide to increase based on you know, uh, current events. Um, so if you, if you did want to see more money in this area, uh, don't hesitate to let his office know. Yeah, I also would say that it's, Mark, it's probably an area that the governor has some sympathies to, so he, something he might be responsive to. And, and you know, things that we ask on the committee is, how was the one and a half million dollars spent last year? Was that, was that spent out of, did we need more based on our performance last year? That's what, our staff works on continuously. So, and, and I don't know the answer to that question. You may, you may have opinions on that. Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> I mean, and we are happy to be a resource to, yeah. to your staff when they're doing that research. Um, right. the, the, that, the way that it was distributed this year, it was um, the, we, we were able to connect our local community to what was available. Um, but it was limited per jurisdiction. Um, so we could only do so much. <laughs> so there was definitely a rollout, you know, I, I think uh, hopefully in future years as, as it grows, um, the need for it will be more, will be known throughout the Commonwealth um, and the, the way in which it's distributed will be um, perfected <laughs> so that we can take advantage of it and, and show the need um, as much as possible. 
yeah, I do not remember anyone talking to our office about that this year, but maybe, maybe you did and I missed it, but we'll be looking for it next year. Great. Uh, one one last Thanks, question Jake. that that um that I see coming and direct to me, so I think maybe Bob, you didn't see it, but um, with all the polarization um in the country in general, is there do you see any places amongst delegates and senators for um, collaboration, um and 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 is it are there are there places of hope for for shared work? Can I, yeah, let me just take a couple of those. Or take that for a second. So, first of all, I, I neglected to mention also that you all, um, and, and in that vein, um, JCRC supported a bill that I carried that had to do with the reduction of methane emissions. And it, it, um, it basically authorized their natural gas companies to um, purchase low emission methane and invest in biomethane projects. So, you know, developing natural gas using things like uh, municipal sewage, wasteland fills, composting facilities, or uh, combined feeding operations with like uh, the livestock. And um, I appreciate your all support on that. That was actually a bipartisan bill, and it was one of the first in the country to work on methane reduction. President Biden just announced that America is going to work to cut our methane emissions by about about 50 percent. Methane makes up about one third of all of all carbon emissions in the world, and there was a, a conference in Scotland last fall you might have seen where the world has pledged to reduce methane emissions and that's coming and Virginia's taking a leading role on that and you guys are part of it by supporting my bill which passed on a bipartisan basis which I'm happy to say that both Delegate Sickles and Delegate Thorsborn both supported so <laughs> thanks for that so talking about bipartisan solutions that's that's one of them um one other thing that's out there is I also passed a bill that that basically uh, authorized a joint bipartisan sort of pandemic autopsy to look at what happened over the last two years, figure out what we did right, what we did wrong, what we need to keep, what we need to get rid of, what we need to do better next time, et cetera. And that's going to be a two-year study that's starting up uh, probably in about a month or two. And I think that that bipartisan you know, inspection is going to result in a lot of ideas that we'll be able to act on in future sessions. And so to me, that's, a, I think, a there's bipartisan interest in just sort of looking at that. You know, we, we haven't had a pandemic like this since 1917. So when they happen, we got to go back and figure out how they went. So that's, those are a couple of things I would say. And, and by the way, I'm going to hop off now because I've, I've been rude to my daughter here at this baseball game and I need to, I need to go and uh, hop off. But thank you for taking the time from the game and from your yeah. event with your daughter. Yeah, and for thank being you. with us. Yeah, thank you guys. Nice. Just more broadly, I would just say before we end too that there's there were as I mentioned there were hundreds of bills that um, we uh, our Democratic caucus passed in the House. So obviously anything we passed in the House meant it was bipartisan, right? Because we were in the minority. So there were a lot of bills and a lot of things that we did get done. I know we spent a lot of time, um, you know, talking about all the bills that that would have rolled back, pro you know, the progress. But we passed a lot of good bills as well. And um, many of the, some of them actually were were passed unanimously, and I mentioned a few ones I've had and some others. But um, there were there were many that got some um, Republican support, at least enough to pass. And uh, so we'll continue to work on that. Great. Um, oh. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to our speakers. Um, and thank you also to, um, to all, of, all of our participants for joining us tonight.